Good evening and welcome to session number four of the Kaiser Music Series entitled Fostering a Growth Mindset in Your Classroom. Today's session is being led by Mr. Ian Miller. Good evening, everybody. <clears throat> Hopefully everyone can hear me okay. A uh, little bit of a different idea with this, but thank you so much for taking the time to join me. Uh, this is something I'm very, very passionate about. It's a kind of a core philosophy in my teaching. Uh, so we're going to go talk a little bit about uh, what growth mindset actually is. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, why should I care, uh, then get into a list some of the practical ends on what can I do in my classroom to promote a growth mindset, and then we'll, we'll open it up for questions. But if you have questions at any time, please uh, go ahead and put them in the chat, and I'll kind of stop several times as we go through as well. So who am I? Uh, as Andrew just said, I'm a PhD student and instructor at the University of Colorado, uh, taught for nine years in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Florida, and Colorado. Uh, my experiences are pretty much all over the place. I, I am a music teacher. I've taught pretty much every area of music that's possible, uh, K through 12. Um, but I've been asked today uh, to talk a little bit more broadly about uh, this kind of idea. So I'll be coming my own examples from a place of music teacher, but of course these principles uh, can be applied anywhere. Uh, and one of my research interests is on beginning musicians and how to motivate them uh, and then education stuff. Okay, so first thing, what is growth mindset? Uh, from the poll, it looks like about half of you are familiar and about half of you are not. So I'm gonna do kind of the, the brief overview. But basically, the idea uh, presented originally and kind of labeled by a researcher by the name of Carol Dweck about 30-ish, almost 40 years ago now, uh, is this idea of we all have two kinds of mindsets about whatever it is we do. And specifically here today, we're going to talk about learning. One side of that is going to be the fixed mindset, and the other side is going to be the malleable or growth mindset. So here we have a, a set idea of my ability to achieve something, which does not promote growth in education, of course, versus this idea that I can improve, that I'm not set or fixed in my ideas. I always have room to improve. I always have room to move forward. Uh, the research specifically in this area is non-music based, even though I am a music teacher, uh, but it's been studied and measured in math and sciences and the language arts. Uh, and in fact, I had uh, a research project scheduled for this fall on, on this, where we were going to take a look at it specifically in a music setting, but don't know if that's going to happen. Um, and then, of course, the two sides we need to think of this are both your own mindset as well as the student mindset, because uh, one of the things we're going to see is that to get our students to think in a growth mindset, we really need to model that behavior. Um, and we'll get into a little bit more detail with that in just a moment. So why should I care about this? So the obvious answer is to get students to see learning as the goal right? It's, it's to create learning as its own value, as its own thing. We're not trying to get them from point A to point B. We're trying to get them from point A to as far as they can possibly go in that field, discipline, content, etc. This in turn serves to create lifelong learners. It can also help to ease frustration and lower anxiety in students. Because how many times do we, you know, see the student who just says, I can't do this. So, by reframing their mindset into a growth-based mindset, it's not binary. It's not, I can do this or I can't do this. It's, I, can, I can't do this yet. I can't do this today, but maybe I can build off of that. Uh, and then that in turn leads to higher levels of student engagement because if students always think they have the opportunity to be successful, they're gonna be more engaged. And of course that engagement is gonna be more consistent as we apply the growth mindset across different areas, because one of the things we'll talk about is how we can have a growth mindset in one area and not necessarily another. So some of the common issues that I see and uh, things I have experienced myself, I, I'm not presenting this as an idea of I am a perfect model of this. 
Um, in my own personal teaching, again, uh, about nine years experience, I would say about halfway through that teaching, uh, I was exposed to Carol Dweck in my graduate studies. Uh, so this would have been about 2014, 2015. Uh, and then reading that book, which deals, and we'll talk more about the actual book itself a little bit later, but as it deals about 50-50 with education and business, or I should say performing fields, because a little bit with athletics and things like that, uh, versus business. Um, but the first kind of misconception that I want to blow up is this idea of, or the notion that we have discrete mindsets. So what I mean by that is, I'm a music teacher. You know, if you put me... I am very confident as a music teacher. I know my content, I know my pedagogy. I'm, I can walk in and do that in my sleep. But you know, if you just change one word of that, math teacher, and put me in front of a classroom, I would not have the same mindset. Um, and we face this in every single aspect of our lives, right? Um, maybe I'm a good driver, but I'm a horrible cook. I'm a good dancer. Um, but I'm a horrible swimmer. You know, we have these mindsets that we create for ourselves over the courses of our life. And this again goes into this idea of we need to model these behaviors for our students. So as many times as you might uh, present to your students that you can't do something, showing them that you're at least trying to grow through that behavior uh, is really important. The other thing to remember there is a lot of times we have the psychological concept of transferability. We tend to think that because one person is good at this thing, that they're going to be good at that thing. And as teachers, sometimes we use that as an opportunity maybe to not check so closely. Well, they, they get the last quiz fine, so I'm going to focus on this kid. And in the meantime, that kid might go ahead and struggle because it's a different content material. So we transfer our perceptions of our students and their ability to do one thing onto uh, another thing. Of course, the next example is just process over product. And as a music teacher, you know, I'm guilty of this, of course, uh, because we put the concert, we put the assessment, we put the festival first a lot of the time. And we don't stress uh, either in our behavior, in our language, in the way we structure our curriculum. We don't stress that, you know, that daily routine, that Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday class is really the important thing. And that the concert is just, you know, something that happens off to the side. So how we frame our class and the ultimate goals of our class, is it to put on a show? Is it to put on a concert? Or is it just to get better at this discrete thing and get better at this discrete thing and get better at this discrete thing and get better at this discrete thing? How we grade is, is kind of one of the biggest issues. And again, totally guilty of this. But um, I saw a rubric the other day. The person is not currently amongst the participants and nor would I do I think they would have a problem with me sharing uh, but it was a music rubric and the bottom of the rubric for one point was student plays no notes correctly and you can imagine two points was some notes and three notes was most notes and four notes was all the notes so the student could play no notes correctly and still get a point student plays all the notes correctly. You can take a professional symphony orchestra player and, and record them playing a Beethoven symphony they've played a hundred times before, and they're still going to miss a note. They're going to miss a dynamic. They're going to miss a rhythm. They're going to make mistakes. So how we set up our grading systems, is, if it is that, you know, you're either doing this or you're doing this or you're doing this, again, making things discrete and not allowing the room for growth and not rewarding that growth in our grading uh, can be an issue how much time we spend with our content. Again, as a music teacher, how many times do we play the concert and we never look at that music again? Or we play that exercise on page seven in the book and we never ever look at that again. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about kind of the spiral curriculum thing and how important that is to revisiting content and then you measuring student growth through revisiting that content. And of course, how we choose to engage our students. I'm going to talk more uh, a little bit later about the kind of more of the facilitator model, where we're seeking to encourage their growth versus, of course, that top-down direct instruction model. I'll pause really quick um, because I've thrown out a lot already. Dr. Hayward, do we have any questions yet? Uh, no questions as of yet. Uh, if you have a question, feel free to type it in the Q&A box and we'll answer them during uh, specific breaks in the presentation. Thank you. Okay. 
So that's really kind of the background, what it is, why it's important. And most of us do these things already in certain aspects of our teaching and certain aspects of our life. But what I'm really trying to get you to do is, is this is very much a philosophical idea, right? It is how do I apply this philosophy of, of positioning growth above fixed uh, in different places in my teaching. So I'm gonna go through a whole bunch of practical kind of examples I, from my life and from uh, some other teachers' experience in my life. This is by no means a complete picture of everything that you can do in the classroom to promote growth because without knowing you know, your classroom, I don't know where to look. Odds are many of these things you might already be doing. Some of these things might just maybe mean tweaking something, maybe a little verbiage or something. And some of them might take some actual rethinking and restructuring of some of your policies and curriculum. Um, the only thing I can really say about that, because of course I understand how big of an undertaking it is, is really think about doing it gradually. Because again, as growth mindset is discrete in many areas, promoting a growth mindset can be discrete in those areas as well. So if all of this information seems a little bit overwhelming and oh my God, I'm not going back with everything else that's going on in the world and completely rebuilding my curriculum for next year the way this guy says to, I get it and I wouldn't do it either. Like I said, for me, this has been about a six year process and by no means am I perfect in doing this. Um, but I try to think about it when I'm building curriculum. I try to think about it, um, especially now as we're shifting to these hybrid and these online models that as a music teacher, give me a really nice opportunity to look more at the individual and promote the growth of the individual, which in turn will promote the growth of the group. Uh, in other subject areas, again, it might be this discrete thing. Let me look at the way I do this. Maybe it's just the grading policy. Maybe it's an assessment policy. Maybe it's my classroom culture. And how can I shape that into a growth mindset? And maybe that's the goal for the year. And if that works, maybe then we build onto that for next year. So. Uh, again, these are some examples from my life, from my teaching, from my experience uh, that we're going to break down. But I, again, just don't want to make it seem like it is completely comprehensive in any way. So growth mindset, of course, touches everything that we do, just not just in our teaching, not just in our education, but in our entire lives. So I kind of broke it down into a couple different areas that we'll look at culture, instruction, feedback, assessment, and curriculum. So starting with building a classroom culture. Peer mentoring. How often do your students get an opportunity to see the growth of each other in your classroom? So a lot of us, you know, we have that idea of, okay, Billy, you finished your, your worksheet, go help little Susie. That's a great model because they get to see how they're progressing. But a couple of ideas to go along with that. First thing, treat them like a real teacher. Give that student going over there a, a way for them to grow as a teacher as well, because we have all the research that says teaching is in many ways the best way to learn something. So we already know that's a constructive use of our time, but how do we make sure and monitor that to make sure it's productive use of each of their time? So Billy, I want you to go help little Susie. Um, she's struggling on you know this problem and on this chemistry worksheet. Um, she, she knows the formula, she knows how to complete the formula, but sometimes she misses which variable she's supposed to insert into the formula. So really focus on that and then try it three times and she, she, she can do it on her own at the end. So give them some goals, give them some scaffolding, give them some direction to go along with that. Uh, but then also in between grades, because who better than their peers to tell them like, this is really important because you're gonna need it again next year uh, when you're in high school or et cetera, et cetera. As a music teacher, uh, Thursdays, always the high schoolers came over after school. I bought them some snacks. I signed off on their, um, on their uh, uh, they got credit for public service or whatever they called it. Um, and I signed off on their forms and they came for an hour every Thursday after school just to do peer mentoring. Uh, not only does it help to build relationships and it helps to kind of build a comfort level of like, okay, yeah, I do understand this because my peers are telling me so is very important. Uh, culture in modeling growth, of course, starts with you. Um, so how much of what we do, do they have an idea where that's supposed to end up? Um, so modeling for yourself. Here's how I used this material to get to where I am today and talk them through the process. I did this in middle school. I did this in high school. I did this in college. And now I do this as a teacher. Or maybe I did this as a teacher. And now I do this as a teacher. Walk them through the process 
uh, of modeling your growth as well. And if it's an area where you don't feel comfortable, of course, you can use other professionals, you can use those peers again, uh, and all of those things. And of course, that goes into a literal understanding of the careers and pathways. What is this content based on? You know, if you can't track the content to something applicable, you know, for someone in daily life, even if it's unlikely that they go into that profession, then it probably is not content worth teaching. I mean, we, we want to keep it at, on some level practical enough to connect to something down the road. So again, explaining where this pathway leads. We know scaffolding exists. We know spiral curriculums exist. But you know, you know, how many times do you sing in class? I'm like, oh, I've heard this before. I heard this in second grade. You know, when you're talking to a sixth grader. Well, guess what? You know, that's intentional and it's part of a pathway and you should know where that pathway leads so that you can in turn monitor your own growth. Questionnaires and surveys, ask. Ask your kids where their questions are. Do you know why you are learning this? It's on the test. Bad answer. We need to go back and talk about this. So setting up again, understanding from the kid's perspective, what content, what material, what pedagogy has value to them, and then going back, and we'll talk more about framing uh, in a little bit, but creating that environment where they have a place to talk and they have a voice. Uh, and then of course, there's yearly progress. Uh, some of you might be familiar with portfolio-based assessment. Uh, he's not here in this meeting. If you wanna go hear about portfolio-based assessment, I highly recommend you talk to uh, Dr. or not Dr. Keith Hodgson at a University of Arts in Philadelphia. He does a great, great presentation on portfolio-based learning. Um, so tracking yearly progress, this just comes back to the content and revisiting and looking at things. So literally, you know, as a music teacher and having students for multiple years, it's a little bit easier, right? But it doesn't have to be yearly progress. It can be monthly progress, quarterly, semesterly. But how, again, are we tracking our own pathways and we tracking our own growth? So not only do our students know where they're going, but they can see and have a better understanding of where they're coming from. I'll pause for another second. Any questions so far? Nothing yet, everyone's being shy. Um, so I did get one question. Uh, any suggestions for giving out a questionnaire in a classroom? Um, if you can, I mean, Google Form is, was always my go-to, was just uh, get the default QR code on the board, uh, answer this in the first five minutes of class today, and you could do that like every Friday or every other Friday or something like that, but giving uh, your students an opportunity to, to talk. Um, uh, and yes, I, uh, I believe the recording is going up on YouTube after this. And then uh, I will make the slides available as a PDF for Dr. Hayward to share as well. Okay, so moving on. Oh, and the name of the professor about portfolio uh, based learning is Keith Hodgson at the University of the Arts. Okay, so instruction, elaborative instruction, students need to understand what they're doing. Direct instruction is certainly going to be part of our classroom when i'm talking about direct instruction uh, we're talking about you know billy don't put that up your nose um stop hitting susie um why do you have you know uh, your phone out why are you reading a magazine in class direct instruction don't do this do that do that does it have a place in redirection and some other things yes it does uh, but getting into the habit of elaborating and again framing uh your instruction around that, here's where this came from, here's where this is, here's where this is going, and taking that time. Uh, it may feel like you're dragging down the class, but guess what? All of a sudden, after time, your kids start grabbing onto that, and they, again, they are actually interested because they have that previous engagement of, well, I was engaged in that, and I wanna be able to do that, so I really should be able to pay attention to that. But they can't reach that level of engagement unless they understand, where they're coming from and where they're going. So framing, very, very, very important. Um, I learned, again, probably about halfway through my teaching to frame as much as I possibly could in terms of the student's self-interest. So again, not, you know, Susie, get that pencil out of your nose, but Susie, get that pencil out of your nose because it might cause a sinus infection, which is going to cause you to not be able to play well this weekend, which is going to hurt your ability to get from point A to point C. So again, putting it on that scaffolding of this is in your own best interest. Um, it's not for me, it's for you. Uh, goal setting. Never set fixed goals. <laughs> 
Um, not uh, so as a music teacher, I could give uh, an idea of a goal. I want to play measures 48 to measure 56 with no wrong notes. Probably not going to happen. And even if it does happen, it's probably just pure luck. Of course, we want to do it setting the goals based upon that elaboration of we're doing this because I heard this yesterday and we need to go to here. So we need to make this. Uh, so we need to improve in this. And it's going to look like what it's going to look like. It might be small growth. It might be medium growth. It might be large growth. All we want is growth. And we need to celebrate all growth equally. OK, uh, because if they're focused on growth. Every day is they're going to be getting better. Um, and, and that is a win, of course, as a teacher, even if they don't necessarily meet that, you know, they scored this at assessment or my kids got this on a standardized test. No, we celebrate growth and, and we make sure that we uh, set all of our goals as growth goals as well. Uh, of course, language, and I'll give some more examples of this later, but how we use language again uh, with the framing, avoiding I statements and, and framing things more uh, towards the student. Uh, one of I you know, my trick words and, you know, a lot of teachers have these kind of phrases, but was using the I wish statements. And I use this both for myself, modeling that, but also when we did any kind of peer, uh, peer critique or anything like that, I wish you would do this, or I wish we would get better at this, uh, rather than I need you to not make any mistakes, or you need to not make any mistakes, or you need to play this note right. I wish we could play all of our notes right. Um, so more general, more we statements, more I wish statements. Um, and again, just watching our language and how often, and, and you'll catch yourself, and I catch myself too, of, of kind of using those language goals. Uh, and then of course, just be as specific as possible, okay? Um, because again, it, it feels like we're taking more time sometimes to take the time and explain and get really kind of nitty gritty with it. And look, I saw 200 kids a day in my last job um, in K-12, but it is worth it because the more that they understand, the more engaged they are, the more progress they're going to make. And ultimately, the less you have to do as a teacher because they're taking more control of their own learning because they have all of the information to do so. Um, so just a couple of quick examples here. So I always liked giving some independent practice time in the beginning of class, but you say I'm a language arts teacher and language arts teachers like English teachers, they're the best at this because revisions are a thing. Drafts are a thing. I mean, do we have that in, you know, math and sciences? Do we even have that in music? You know, do we grade upon the result or do we grade upon the process? And I just personally, I think language arts teachers in general do this just through drafting and the revision process. You're showing the students that it's okay to make mistakes so long as we go back and we have a plan to improve. Um, and ultimately, you're going to get to that really great place. So, but here's an example of just some basic independent work time. I'd like you to read chapter one today is a fixed goal. I'd like you to read as much as you can in 10 minutes. The goal is open ended, but still measurable. So you can measure and encourage that growth. Hey, Susie, I saw you made it two pages further than yesterday. Wonderful job. And then you can celebrate that they met their objectives. They exceeded their expectations based upon their performance the previous day. Uh, so you avoided fixed goals and promoted continued growth. Okay. Feedback kind of goes hand in hand with instruction because, of course, it's what happens after instruction. Um, positive versus in constructive feedback. So I am not promoting negative feedback in terms of you did not meet our growth goals, but positive reinforcement without that that's fixed is bad. You played that note right. Great. And leaving it at that, yes, makes the student feel good for a second, but do they understand why they felt good? Hey, Susie, you played that A that you missed yesterday. Let's make sure we keep continuing to grow that. That's it. You know, or can we now apply that to that, that A in measure 64 or later in the song? Um, all of these ideas, just again, framing towards that idea of growth and moving our feedback in that direction as well. Uh, descriptive and prescriptive feedback. So when we do have something that we need to get fixed, making sure we're explaining not just, you know, don't play an E flat, in, you know, in that part of the music, 
uh, or that formula is wrong, but really getting breaking it down uh, and prescribing a way or multiple ways for students to improve. It's good teaching, right? Um, but again, how we frame that in towards not a fixed goal, but in towards growth, that's the important part. Um, how you might use reward systems and how you might set goals in your class. I talked a little bit about this before with the goal setting and of course that goes there with uh, the prescriptive feedback as well. Uh, but you know, a lot of us use reward systems in our classrooms. I did too, but how many of them are based upon say fixed goals versus growth goals? Um, odds are there is something you wish as a class the group did better and was using to improve. So how can we focus on that rather than like everyone brought their pencil today or, or everyone remembered their binder today or things like that. Now, if it's based and you have somewhere to improve with that, you know, everyone remembered their binder today, let's make sure everyone remembers their pencil tomorrow and you frame it as some kind of growth, that's fine. But celebrating uh, that fixed idea, um, wanna, something again, we wanna try to avoid. Uh, and gamification, if you're not familiar, is basically just kind of the more fancy point-based system. Some of you teaching elementary school uh, might use various apps, uh, Flipgrid and, and other things in that area. Um, I think they're great. I, I, I think they're great. Again, just so long as you set the goal as progress, you know, we earned this many points this week. Um, I think it's reasonable that we should be able to improve that to this many uh, group, you know, this many points next week. Um, and then again, going back into kind of the language we use, not if you can do this, but when you can do this, of course, is a very important thing. And of course, that amazing, amazing word, yet. You know, Billy, I'm, you did not get any questions right on your math quiz, but when you go home and study, you'll be able to at least get half of them. Again, just reframing how we give the feedback, and sometimes it is hard because we, we see that as, you know, there is a 99.99999% chance that kid is not going to improve. But it's not our job to think that way. It's our job to promote their continued growth. And really what it does is it puts the onus more on the student. I'm framing this as here's how you can improve. I'm going to facilitate your tools to do that, as we'll talk a little more about a little bit later. Um, and you're going to pick those tools as well. I mean, you're going to be involved in that process. Uh, parents might be involved in that process as well. But ultimately, we can keep tacking on these supports as far as we want to, to reach that point of when or yet. Um, before I move on, actually, let me just do the example really quick, and then I'll answer a couple questions that come up. Uh, so example that I thought that sounded great because I could hear the middle voices blending in better with the low, I wish. I wish. Uh, next time the upper winds, flutes, clarinets, and oboe could now fit within the sound of those little voices, percussion, listen to see if they're able to. Good feedback cycle. I wish I could say that every piece of feedback I ever gave in my class was that well-rounded, uh, but usually you don't have time to think about them. But as you start to look at those discrete elements of maybe adding the I wish statements, maybe setting the open-ended goals, maybe it's connecting it to those past materials so they can see where they progress, just adding one discrete element at a time is, is really how to go. Um, and then of course, follow up with, with progress and feedback. So uh, one of the great question, um, I knew that was gonna come up, how do you keep track on individual progress in a large class? Planning ahead. <laughs> um, it, it takes time. And it's one of the main reasons I recommend um, looking at one element at a time. You're, you're not gonna throw all of this into your classroom and your curriculum all at once. But the, the idea here is ultimately a lot of these things, students can be tracking their own growth. <clears throat> so let's say for example, as a music teacher, I'm trying to get students to grow just by their practice time. Then it's just something as simple as a practice log. You know, am I tracking, you know, the, the kids practicing 90 minutes a week? No, I'm just showing them that you know, here's when, here's what you're doing, and here's why you're doing it. And then maybe after the fact, you know, when we're looking at, well, why am I getting C's in my class, Mr. Miller, instead of B's? Well, let's maybe go back and look and, and see how these two things compare. So my first piece of advice is just as much uh, of, of your growth goals as possible, have your students self-tracking. Um, 
the other, of course, um, and this is for me and, and what I'm comfortable with is QR codes and Google Forms. Um, because I would have, you know, my laptop just like it is right now in the front of my classroom and I could have those forms set up and a lot of those things I would enter in while my students were in that independent study time. So for me, I gave five to 10 minutes in the beginning of class every single day uh, for independent practice time. And I would redirect if I saw kids getting off, if I saw a kid doing something exceptionally well, I would praise them for it. If I saw a kid maybe struggling in a section, maybe we talked through it either individually or as a class, how can we grow through those mistakes? Uh, but giving myself that five to 10 minutes, it was of a 55 minute class, uh, so I had the time to do that. Of course, I've been in those 30 minute class situations as well where it's, it's a lot harder. Um, but um, just kind of having those things set up and those forms set up so I could go around really quick and just really pick on like what I was gonna be focusing for my content for that day. Um, and of course, sometimes things are going to spring up and you're not going to get to fill out that tracking thing that you really want to, but, you know, just creating a system for yourself. that's not even grading, but just, you know, really quickly how, you know, uh, one through five scale, how, how is my students posture doing? Okay. Music teacher, right? So I can just look around the classroom really quick, enter that in for that class. And I'm keeping track of that because that's where I want my students to grow. Um, but yeah, as much as you possibly can set it up so your students are self-tracking. Uh, any recommendations for strategy for differentiating? Talk to your kids and figure out what their goals are. Um, that's my kind of generic answer. Of course, it, it depends too many on circumstances on, on what content you're trying to differentiate. Um, but of course, I'd be happy to talk with you as I'll talk about at the end uh, if there's any specific kind of content. But First and foremost, having the data to kind of back that up, but don't think that data is a scary thing. It's like, just pick one thing a day, that's it. Um, and then another one, any recommendations for reward systems for middle school students? Um, there's a million of them. So for me, um, I, I kind of had a checklist of five things. Um, music teacher, so the first thing was, do you have your instruments out in your seats uh, in under three minutes? Does everyone have a binder? Does everyone have a pencil? Um, uh, did everyone submit their, their last assignment kind of things? I basically just have a couple of, of different checkoffs. Uh, and then basically out of those five, they would get a point value, one through five, and that would go uh, class by class on the board and they would be able to see where they were. And then it just became a race you know, who could reach the top and that uh, top class um, got uh, an ice cream party or they, I think, I know, I let them choose. They always chose ice cream, but it was like, they got to choose an ice cream party, a pizza party or a waffle Sunday party, a couple of different things. But the goal was open-ended, right? It wasn't, you know, you need to do this. It was, here's what you can do. And as much as you can, that's what's gonna show your growth. Um, and it was fun because a lot of times the older students wouldn't win. It was, it was actually the younger kids would win because they were more focused on, on getting to a point where they could just compete. And in that growth that they would solve to get to the point where they could just like compete with the older kids, all of a sudden they'd find that if they just continued with those habits, they were far exceeding them. Um, what sites are easy to use for gamification? I teach accounting um, to their financials as part of a game. I would love to talk to you because I, I don't know that much about what might be used for accounting, especially depending upon the grade level, but please send me an email because I just intellectually would love to go through that with you and, and help you try to figure that out. <clears throat> okay, next. Curriculum. Um, connectivity and the spiral curriculum. You've heard me talked about this like a million times. I'm not going to go into it, but understanding where you came from, understanding where you're going and what growth is needed to get you there. Um, supplemental materials built for independent learning and support. So this goes along with differentiating uh, and asking those questions. What can I do? I always finish my class with, with two phrases. Uh, is there anything you need and is there anything I can do to help you? Um, because it kind of covers both ends of the spectrum, right? Is there anything I can do to help you is more open-ended and the kids usually don't speak up about that unless of course they have an idea what, what they're trying to achieve in terms of needing to grow. Um, but you know, do you need anything? That's more of just a, something I would do to help them feel like creating a safe space and safe environment. But um, just ask, 
really, really, really just ask. So that may be the questionnaire, that might be the survey. Uh, and then you know where you need to differentiate. Because a lot of times, again, because we, we go with that idea of transferability, we make assumptions that you know this worked for this, it's gonna work for this kid for that. But of course that isn't necessarily true. And look, it's gonna be a lot of building um, supplemental materials in the beginning but of course like most things you just build it up over time so again maybe it's focusing on one thing this year uh, and adding something next semester etc cetera, etc cetera, in terms of supplemental materials for those kids uh, so in a music class for those of you i would my supplementals teaching a performance-based class like a band or an orchestra were of course the the more the other standards were things based around music history were things based around music theory were based around conducting and a whole bunch of different things that the kids could do if they found an interest in the content where they could continue to, to learn and grow. But always having like another thing, never, uh, okay, the chapter's over and we're moving on, or this unit is over and we're moving on. But this unit is over because we need to move on to this. But if you wanna continue studying this, here's some supplemental materials you can choose to pursue. And only one kid in a hundred might do it, but guess what? That one kid might be the one who goes on to, you know, in the, in the biology class, who goes on to, you know, cure some rare disease because they had a teacher that promoted them and kind of left things open-ended so they had a chance to explore those curiosities. Um, of course, your content, and is it for an objective or is it for the process? Um, for me as a music teacher, uh, picking music that was about reinforcing the, the pedagogy and the content that we were going over and never uh, teaching music or what we would say over programming things that I would necessarily need to teach new content in order for them to achieve it. So my content came from my unit instruction class that I was assessing that basically was coming out of like a method book or a textbook and everything went along with that. And then the music we did for a concert, that was just stuff we did for fun. I, I put zero weight uh, I did assess for concerts, but my concert assessment was a checklist of 10 items. Are you wearing the right color socks? Did you show up at the right time? Did you remember to tie your hair back if you have long hair? That's all it was. I never, ever, 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 ever put a grade on their performance in, in a concert. Um, performance assessments in class, as we'll talk about in a minute, uh, individual assessments, 100%, but never uh, never wanted to put any weight on the ultimate product. It was always on, we do this, to do this, to do this, to do this, and then we get to do this as, as form as the content. Uh, and then of course, picking the content to support that. Um, guided practice, I talked about that five to 10 minutes I, I would put in the beginning of class, I would challenge you, uh, something I have never seen, you know, in, in say a science class. And I've, I, I like to go around and spend time in other some rooms and so not picking on science teachers, but you know, how much are we guiding them through that process? How much are we adding the revision process of drafting and actually observing how our students work? Um, because really the best part of that was not so much that I, you know, that they were getting the practice time. It was really that it got to let me see how they practice. Uh, how they work through their problems, where they get frustrated versus where they're able to breeze through. And by making those observations in my class, it helped me better understand how to differentiate and better help those, those kids and helped redirect them on how to use those strategies when they were working independently as well. Uh, and then we already talked a little bit about grading and I'm gonna give you an example in just one second because one of the big things I'm like, how do you grade this way, right? Um, so I'm gonna give an example in a second. Um, so, um, so some of the types of examples we could use uh, as a growth assessment for performance, I'm gonna show a slide of that in just a second. Uh, I really like this idea. This was brought to me by a math teacher of custom exams, pools of questions by difficulty. So let's say the exam is worth 10 points. Um, a kid who feels really confident in the content and material might just do two five point questions. A kid who may, might need a little bit more help and a little bit of support, maybe they get to choose like five two point questions that are a little bit easier and maybe a little bit more scaffolded on the way so that the student still feels like they're accomplishing something, they are still demonstrating some knowledge of the material, but maybe they're not at the point where they can synthesize that material yet and coalesce it into something. Well, are we punishing them for, for being on the growth process, but for not having reached that goal yet? 
yeah, we can be if we're, if we're grading everyone in the same way. So having that pool of questions, um, you know, and especially if you're doing like di digital quizzes and digital exams, either through something like Canvas or, or Google Classroom, where you have some of those plugins that can allow you to do those kinds of things uh, to randomize tests and things like that, or just having a link to, you know, here's the hard, here's the medium, here's the easy. And it's not necessarily, and I actually, I wouldn't call them hard, medium, easy at all, but here's the two by, you know, the two five point questions. Here's, um, you know, one five point question and five one point, however you want to mix it up. Um, but giving some students, again, some, some options because they, they know, right. They know going into the quiz, what they know and what they don't know. So give them that, um, that opportunity to, to kind of, choose to reward themselves on their growth and, and not emphasize the product. Uh, and then of course, students pick their own areas of focus and content. So you, and you provide a menu for support. So I literally had a menu in the front of my classroom, my last year teaching, um, you know, it was everything from, you know, you need after school help to maybe you need five to 10 minutes uh, on your own during class time. And if a, if a student showed me that they needed an extra five minutes of class, on their own where I could let them go off in a corner or I could let them put their instrument down and write things into them. If they showed me that they were using that time productively, I had no problem with that at all. Um, it could be choosing a peer to help support them. It could be, again, maybe saying like, I can do the even numbers from, the, from this worksheet. Uh, and then maybe next week I can do the odd numbers. And then by the week after that, maybe I'll be ready to do the full thing. Those kind of scaffolds just make a menu and let them choose. I mean, they're going to be specific to your class, but, um, you know, really letting them, you know, if they understand where they where they came from and if they understand where they're trying to go, let them choose how they want to get there. Don't force them to necessarily all take that same path. Uh, so of course, yeah, this is, <laughs> everyone always asks for an example. So this is a performance rubric that I made, um, to basically be a growth-based assessment. I'm leaning forward because it is, it is small, but again, uh, the, the PowerPoint will put into PDF for everyone. Um, so, you know, standard music performance assessment, I'm looking at pitch, so are they playing the note rights, the rhythms right, uh, musicality, so volume, dynamics, all of that fancy stuff, and then the technique, are they doing the right things with the instrument, and all of that. And I'll break that down, and I'll spend the first few weeks of the school year having them do peer assessment so they get really, really, really comfortable with the rubric. But where it throws most people off is the grading out at the bottom. So the whole idea is that it's pre-assessment, post-assessment, um, how you choose to separate those things in terms of time, in terms of beginning a unit, end a unit, one week, next week, it's gonna depend upon your own curriculum. But basically we're looking at where did you start and where did you go from? And that's how we're gonna grade you. So for example, let's say we have a really strong student. Okay, so their pre-assessment, they come in and they get you know, all fours. And I would say if they're getting all fives in the pre-assessment, you're not providing them enough rigor. But let's say they come in and they get all fours in their pre-assessment. So what I would do is I would look down at the bottom of the grading and I would look at that column that starts with a four. So basically they only have two grades. I don't include the, the opportunity that they could go backwards. Of course they could go backwards, um, but that brings up like a whole nother thing. And again, we're looking at celebrating growth. So I actually wouldn't knock points off if they go backwards. Um, just kind of a, uh, partly a motivation thing, partly how I choose to frame things in my classroom that I'm not going to punish you, right? Because that's what it would be for taking a point off. I'm not going to punish you for trying something and, and doing worse at it. Um, so yeah, so if I'm looking at the grading column, they basically, if they started on fours, they're already going to get a B. And if they get up one point, they can, they can get an A. Notice how I do not have any 100s. Um, basically, I would usually give them some kind of bonus goal in order to get a 100 because 100 in my mind is perfect and how often does anyone do anything perfect? No, you 95, you get an A. To get the plus, you gotta do a little something extra. Um, but now let's look at like a struggling student. So let's look at a student who got like all ones. Okay, so look at the column that has the one on top and going down. So one less than 60%. So in my old district's grading policy, that would have been a D. So we're gonna give them, we're gonna give them a 65, okay? If they get even a little bit better, they've already gone up to a C, which is average. If they get two points, if they can go from just a two to a four, so they can go, I'm rewarding them with the B. 
Uh, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the one column. I started reading the two column, looking at the one column. So if they go up two points, uh, they're, already at, they're already at an 80, they're at a B. But by moving up three, they're at a B plus, which is a pretty solid score. And the opportunity is still there for them to get a 95. But if you look at, say, the horizontal line, look at, look at three rows down. So where it starts, plus two, plus two, plus two, plus two. And you'll see how the grades change for the level of growth, okay? So from a one to two for the, the, like the worst kid, they're getting an eight point bump. For a one to two from the next, I shouldn't say worst, but the most next struggling kid is only getting a seven point bump. And, and as you start to see things, you start to see that, you know, a kid who goes from like a one to a three is still getting a B in your class. Okay, so they could, they could start out really god awful and end up average and still be getting a B in your class. And into my philosophy of teaching, a B is, you know, excellent. An A is exceptional, but a B is excellent. So they can get to excellent just by making measured progress. The expectation is not necessarily there that they're going to go from 1 to a 5. The opportunity is there for them to go from 1 to a 5. But they can be doing excellent in my class if they're just showing some growth, basically. Uh, the numbers, look, it, it's going to depend upon your class, and you're going to have to work things out. It might seem like a complicated grading policy, but really, again, I would spend the first maybe two weeks having them do uh, peer assessments in class, so they were really breaking down how I used the rubric kind of through their own eyes, and they understood it, and I used that for all three years I had them, and we're celebrating growth. So that's what a growth-based rubric can look like. Okay. So I'm going to stop here. I'm doing pretty good on time, but before I move on to like what you can do with this material and kind of what's going to happen next, I'm definitely going to open up for some questions. So I'll pause for a second. Anybody? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll keep talking and I'll stick around at the end if anyone has anything. Um, so where this research is going. So for me uh, personally and researching for this for music education, um, basically what we're trying to do uh, at CU, uh, myself, Jim Austin and Jacob Polster, um, planning a study, the one that was supposed to go to the International Symposium, which was canceled this summer and hopefully the National Conference for Music Education uh, in Florida this fall. Um, but basically looking at how beginner instrumentalists, what their different motivation types are. So we're going to be looking at a whole bunch of kind of previously established psychological tools for measuring um, student motivation, things like self-concept and self value and, and all of a whole bunch of different things that I'm not going to get into now. But basically measuring that as it applies to their performance ability and also to student retention. So how motivated are these kids to produce in class and how motivated are they to continue on with that and continue growing. Uh, also has some additional reading. Uh, the Daniel Pink, The Drive in particular is really, really popular right now. It's a great book. Uh, but just some others to, to kind of take a look at. Talent is overrated, grit. And of course you can just buy the growth mindset. Uh, a lot of these books have to deal both with performance focused things um, like music and dance and, and athletics, performance psychology, uh, but also education and also business. And I definitely recommend not skipping through the business things because uh, sometimes we forget how much of what we do as teachers or professors mirrors on kind of business and management practice. So sometimes I find those things to be helpful as well. So some questions uh, to basically ask yourself, because I want you to keep thinking about this, because if you came in with a fixed mindset, my goal is that you're coming out of here thinking about what are some of those fixed mindsets in your life that you do have the opportunity to turn around that will benefit not just you, but also benefit your students. So the first question I have is what areas of your own life and teaching, you know, have a fixed mindset? For me, I'm a horrible dancer, but like, I need to take dance lessons, right? That's what I need to do. Um, do you have someone objective in your life that you can talk to about analyzing your content instruction for examples of fixed goals? This stuff is habitual. You know, 37 years old, 
I've had that fixed mindset for dancing, right? It's, it's not going to fix itself overnight. So having people around you, whether it's peers at work, whether it's, you know, your, your, your partner, um, somebody that you can talk to and talk through these goals and, hey, do you see a way where I'm presenting this as, as being fixed? Um, but just that kind of adding that to your own reflective practice. Uh, and then, like I said, I would challenge you to just pick one unit or one aspect of your class that you could completely growthify and try to think about what it would look like. Um, maybe it is that reward system. Maybe it is uh, gamifying some, some student self-assessment. Maybe it is um, adding in some, some student, you know, some peer growth tracking. Maybe it's adding in that guided practice portion. Um, but, you know, pick one thing, try it. If it works, maybe you keep trying more. Um, but just remember that the fixed and the malleable work not just for students, but work for teachers too. So if you're telling yourself, I can't change my teaching right now, guess what? You're stuck in a fixed mindset. Uh, and then of course, if you're interested, you can look into grabbing a book on growth mindset or read more about Carol Dweck. Her website's excellent. Um, one of those people in the profession that I can honestly just pitch, I don't know her personally. Um, but I've been talking about this for a few years now and, and she provides a lot of really, really good material. And of course now it's, it's kind of a generational thing where it's becoming more popular as it enters the kind of the second generation of people who grew up with it. Um, and it's evolving a little bit and it's, it's, it's been really interesting to kind of read the research and see how this stuff is getting applied. And then last thing before we open up for any other questions. If I can help, if you're looking for professional development, virtual live on this topic, or if you have any follow-up questions, please feel free to reach out. There's my email. It is very complicated, ian.miller at colorado.edu, um, especially now during the summer. And uh, most, about four-fifths of my teaching uh, in the fall looks like it's going to be online. So especially doing these kind of virtual sessions, I've done this as a, as a district PD before. Um, if you just want to talk through a problem in your class, I am one of those crazy people that will respond to your emails in a timely manner and get back to you. So I'd love to talk about this before because it helps me learn and helps me grow about different ways this stuff can be applied, especially looking at it outside the music classrooms as well. So that's it from me. If we have any other questions, Dr. Hayward, I went one minute over. I think that's quite all right. It's some great information. Uh, so we'll give a, just a couple moments. If you have any last questions, please put them in the chat now. Um, a lot of a lot of great information, a lot of stuff to process. So, yeah, sorry it's so much, <laughs> uh, but like I said, please please feel free to to email out. Um, you're very welcome. Uh, the name of the professor for the portfolio again. His name is Keith Hodgson, H O D G S O N, uh, and he is a professor at the University of the Arts in Philadelphia. Um, he is a friend of mine. Um, uh, but he, he does a really, really great session on, on how to establish a kind of portfolio-based learning for, in a music setting. And he had a couple hundred kids in his old band program. So he's, he's got a lot of practice on that. So I think everyone has enough information for the evening. <laughs> okay, please go, uh, everyone. Thank you so much for coming in. Some, some really, really great questions. Again, please feel free to email. Uh, anything you have as a follow-up, and I'd be happy to talk through some, some of these things with you. Uh, again, encourage you, look for growth in your own teaching. Don't try to go home and, you know, say, like, I'm going to try all of this and it's going to work or it's not going to work. Pick one thing to make better and, and try, to, try to frame it in a growth mindset and, and just see where you go from there. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you again, uh, Mr. Miller. Uh, so this has been session number four of the Kaiser Music Series. Uh, tomorrow and Thursday, we do have a percussion, uh, mallet percussion sessions at 3 p.m. Um, and this recording will probably be available along with session three by the weekend. So thank you very much and everyone be safe. Good night. Bye-bye.